not, so were now two lesbians with goddess power in a reflecting pond in their little yard with statues of Isis, Athena, and Mother, Mother Mary, too. The signs are part of it, is why the signs help you know it's not always going to be what you see because of the way you want it to be. But a jackrabbit eaten from your yard and garden means you'll prosper well. The state gave me money to put some heat in that old shack of mine, and my caddy's still running. See it parked down by the house? It needs some paint, but it'll probably run longer than me, I'd say. She pointed to her pink ribbon. They say I beat that cancer I had. It's been eight years now. Pen care took care of me back when we had it. Couldn't do it now, though, and the signs can make it better when it gets real bad. If a hawk comes down and picks up a young rabbit in the roadside gully, someone's child's going straight up to heaven. They're a way to hold on to something that's with you, speaking to you from our world, a world that's not always your reality. When I've seen the bird, I worried it might be coming for my own, but now I remember how Jared loved little ponies. She always had one in her pocket, her honey-colored hair, down to her waist, tied in a ponytail, too. No matter who the signs are meant for, they're there for anyone to ponder. Yes, that man with his reaper is grim, grim, grim. Wouldn't be so bad if we'd find the heaven within, learn to reach out a hand, and that it ain't no bother to help each other. The signs can help you. And why is it? The signs are part of it, the all of it. That's the why of it, the way it is, and the way it has to be.
last seen in the arms of a homeless man on 47th Avenue. And Saturday, there's a great yard sale, everything you need or dreamed of, at a price you can easily afford. Blood is accepted, type A only, but no one wants a piece of your tattered soul. A 12-year-old retriever lab mix has disappeared, leaving a fourth grade girl desolate. Please return, no questions asked. And someone has lost their mother, who peers over reading glasses on the poster, faded blonde hair on a perfect page boy, an impish hint of a smile. She is 65. They do not say if she suffers early dementia like the man who went missing last fall and was found sitting on a curb a few blocks away eating Cheetos, <laughs> which as children say he ate. So we don't know whether to worry that she has fallen prey to some demented criminal on her way to Walgreens or simply fell in love with the cabbie from Malaysia on the way to the airport or perhaps ran out of patience with her children helpfully trying to run her life went on a 10-day retreat at Spirit Rock. <laughs> we don't know whether to pray to the gods for her safe return or for her successful escape. Yeah. 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 Woo. Oh. Hope. Bats are not blind. Few subtly see others. Sometimes bite the noses off their mates in passion. Things are often not what they seem. Homo sapiens are far from sapiens, and yet we still believe in fairies and sunrises, in peace treaties and elections, children's laughter, newborn foxes, Voyager space probes, and prescient dreams of sailing through rainbows, blown into fruition by a lover's breath, ruffling the fine hair on the back of our neck just as dreams unfold us. <laughs> sea change. I ain't got a boat this month. That's part of why I haven't been around here. The tide is out. Egret walks the buffet line at the edge of the marsh. Cormorant dives through deeper treasures. We discuss through hull fittings and cockpit drains check rigging, laugh at our tired, dirty selves and each other, snuggle together at night easily as though we have always been lovers. Oh, 
want to do a tone poem tonight. Lou the fact that you do one now, okay? you leave me alone you've got no place to stay i got no place and you think that's okay as long as you get away i got the ghetto way i'm reclaiming a lifestyle today i may not make it where i'm portraying myself to get to but i know that i'm going to let you The warm cockles on my chest hairs rub up against the languid soliloquy that escapes my membranes in order to emap my little a uh, conflagrated situation having to way too much cyberspace, I guess, because it's the people I love the most that's harder to get to my motherfucking website. <laughs> and uh, cars? I call them death monsters. I was driving cabs early 90s in Colorado. Had to be a night driver. I want to drive where there's no traffic. <laughs> <laughs> where else? Where else can you get to? <laughs> you know. So and it happened to work out for me fortuitously, but um, I cannot help eschewing any corporate life. I start to get. To thinking about because you know what time is up. You have no more time. You let Enron overrun your life. You let. No, wait a second. I'm preaching the choir. Hey, I love you. <laughs> and now we have Stephanie Manning stepping up to the mic. Thank you, step over there. So she's stepping up. And our beautiful and wonderful magical teachers of the evening, of which I will speak highly of in due course. I feel lucky to have it. Um, so I'm going to read from Wilfred Owen, who uh, lived during World War I and had a horrible like, war experience, became shell shocked, went to a hospital. They thought they cured, they didn't know it was trauma, you know, post trauma and all that. So they thought they cured him and sent him back to war where he died. Twenty-five years old. So anyway, before he uh, pa passed, uh, he wrote rather a lot of poems. And so here's, I'm going to read one of his here's time I'll read two. This is called Insensibility. One, happy are men who yet before they are killed can let their veins run cold, whom no compassion flears or makes their teeth soar on the alleys cobbled with their brothers, the front line withers, but they are troops who fade, not flowers, for poets cheerful fooling, men gaps for filling, losses who might have fought longer, but no one bothers. 
too, and some deep feeling, even themselves or for themselves, dullness best, re best solves fatigue and doubt of showing, and chance's strange arithmetic comes simpler than the reckoning of their showing. They keep no check on army's decimation. Three, happier those who lose imagination, they have enough to carry with ammunition. Their spirit drags no pack. Their old wounds, save with cold, cannot more ache. Having seen all things red, their eyes are rid of the hurt of the color of blood forever, and carry first constriction over. Their hearts remain small drawn, their senses in some scorching cautery of battle, now long since iron, can laugh among the dying unconcerned. Four, happy the soldier home, not uh, with not a notion how somewhere every dawn some men attack and many sighs are drained. Happy the lad whose mind was never trained. His days are worth forgetting more than not. He sings along a march which we march uh, taciturn because of dust, the long for long relentless trend from larger day to huger night. Five. We wise who, with the thought besmirch, blood all over our soul, how should we see our past but through the, his blunt and lashless eye? Alive he is not vital overmuch, dying not mortal overmuch, nor sad, nor proud, nor cu curious at all. He cannot tell old men's perfidies from his. Six, but cursed are dullards whom no cannon stun, that they should be as stone. Wretched are they in mean, with paucity that never was simplicity. By choice they made themselves immune to pity, and whatever mourns in man before the last scene and the hapless stars. Whatever mourns when many leave these shores, whatever shares the eternal reciprocity of tears. This is called Minor. And he wrote this uh, pretty much just before he died. There was a whispering in my heart, a sigh of the cold, grown wistful of a former earth it might recall. I listened for a tale of leaves and smothered ferns, fronds forests, and the low fly lies before the fawn. My fire might show steam phantoms simmer from time's old cauldron before the birds made nests in summer or men had children. But the coals were murmuring of their mind and mo moans down there of boys that slept rise sleep and men rising for air. And I saw white bones in the cinder shards, bones without number, for many hearts with coal are charred and few remember. I thought of some who worked dark pits of war and died, digging the rock where death repeats peace lies indeed. Comforted years will sit soft chaired in rooms of amber. The years will stretch their hands well cheered by our life's ember. The centuries will burn rich loads with which we groan, whose warmth shall lull their dreaming lids while songs are crooned. But they will not dream of us poor lads lost in the ground. So, um, two shorts, and then something that's medium. So the good news, we'll begin with that. It's called One Small Step, and that's in quotes because people know what that means. It was a time of dreams when hope, like never before, had everyone looking up. All around the world, they said it. We did it. Not Americans, not they, but we. It was a time when we saw what we could do. And when I saw that fragile, singular, 
blue, white, brown, and green marble rise above a haunting dead gray horizon, saw that one place amid a bitter, cold, vast, and dark. I believed that chance had come to be in favor of life, and that justice, favored by the arc of history, would take us all to the heights, to that mountaintop, and we turn to regard one another with a perspective that has made all the difference and which yet plays out the world over, bringing us towards peace. And so this is this is a segue from that, and then the last one segues to eternity, which we all love and enjoy. This one's called Send in the Clowns. And it's, it's based on a true news story. You can still look this up and think, that's really true. Anyway, it would have been ordinary. By that I mean when the notorious VNN, Vanguard News Network, a skinhead neo-Nazi slash KKK movement, organized a protest trying hard to work up a headline in Knoxville, Tennessee. It was a no-brainer. But <laughs> this time they were met by the opposition. The 100th ARA, Anti-Racist Action, Clown Brigade. <laughs> so it was clowns versus Nazis. <laughs> Alex Linder, the Nazi organizer, kicked off the action when, incensed with white-hot anger, he charged the clowns, who were probably mincing about trying to tap dance in their big red shoes or busy blowing up balloons. He was dropped like the bag of filth that he was by four police officers who dragged him off, yes, kicking and screaming. Not to be deterred, however, the remaining Nazis chanted, White power. <laughs> White flower? The clowns cheered in the line. As some gaily ran in circles, tossing flower into the air, others raised up a set of letters to spell out, you guessed it, White F-L-O-U-R. As yet unfazed, the Nazis again chanted, White power, and the clowns stared, then conferred realizing an error had been made, <laughs> promptly cheered, white flowers, white flowers. <laughs> As some tossed a myriad of floral samples into the air, others cavorted and disported with good humor, demonstrating a willingness to find common ground. White power, the Nazis tried to clarify their meshes. <laughs> oh, the clouds chanted, tight shower, tight shower. As two held up a shower head, all the others valiantly tried to crowd under it. After all, they were just trying to please. <laughs> By this time, Nazi eyes were bugging out of their, and their voices were hoarse, and a few were clutching their breasts, trembling with rage. Imagine that. In a final attempt to get their word out, a few formed a line, stepped out in front, and with every mighty muscle of their so-called brains, every fiber of their bestial being, they beat on their chest, pulled up their hair, jumped up and down to give it their all. White power, white power. At this ape-like display, the clowns seriously took a pause, stared. It was a delicious moment. Oh, the women clowns said, white power. <laughs> As some raised those letters in the air, the others grabbed the nearest male clown, hoisted him on into the earth, and ran about merrily chanting, white power, white power, white power. <laughs> Well, to make a very long story short, the vaunted VNN rally never quite got off the ground. And over, uh, however, the 100th Cloud Brigade got great applause. And so it was that after a while, everyone just went home, but except Alex. So sometimes it pays to read the news, my friends. I mean, I could have made that stuff up for the life of me. And I want to thank a friend of mine, Amber, for posting the link. The story certainly made my day, and I hope this poem has brightened yours. <laughs> True story. And, and now I'll close with the future, which, which has, well, never mind, the future. <laughs> there are ages that come and go. Lands that vanish, seas which move. Time does not speak to us of these creatures. Time does not speak to us at all. It is heard, we are dead. It would signal, but it is heard, we are blind. 
They would do a song and dance, go the extra mile, give us the whole nine yards. But we are not at home anymore in this world. And time knows that. That's why time is going its own way now, leaving us to ours. If we were wise, we'd take heed, ask after it. But we aren't wise, that is, so we won't. And it's not as if we have it for the longest time seem to care not little, one little, teeny tiny bit. And now, well now time has run out. And it's all on us. By the way, do you hear the fat lady singing? <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. My mother thanks you, my father thanks you. My brother would thank you for your This brings us to Margaret Joseph before our feature, Connie Post and Kevin Gunn. Co features. So Margaret Joseph, come up here. Warm up the mic one final time. Give us your all. Your song. Your song. Your song. Sing home and be quiet. Good evening, Sacred Ground. Good evening, Martin Um Usually another poet has to die before I read their poems here at the <laughs> Sacred Grounds. Um, but uh, this is not that case. I got my annual disbursement of poems from my good friend Ken Okuno uh, yesterday. and. So I'm going to read you one of his, assuring you that he is very much alive. This one is called, Just So People Can Dance. My dad went through his fishing stuff before he took to the bed of compassion, held his old bamboo creel that saw a thousand fish. Man, I sure had a lot of fun with this. I felt the emotion of clear mountain, high altitude sun, creek willows, the stream, the freedom, the mystery, mostly the freedom, the joy, the rush, fish too. For men, there must be a prize. For me, there are these guitars I've kept 50 years, not the wood and steel and plastic, but the bandmates and the gigs. The funky dives, the absurd show business moments, the transcendent beauty when hardly anyone else noticed, it grooved just so people could dance. A thing like dharma that you have to experience after much practice. Can't explain it, how we were so beautiful in our innocence and our imperfection. The recently deceased would understand all who elected to enter into life embracing physical pain and limitation now they see clearly the whole idea is to know the spirit in the body, in the river, in the groove, to transcend the physical through the physical, to feel the absolute in the relative, fishing in the mountains, playing funky gigs, hearing pine needles hit the roof, and years later on the sky ridge, hearing the dakinis sing. I looked at my old strap like my dad looked at his creel. He had 80 years against long odds, he knew when he hit a groove just so he could dance. And I will read you one more from Mr. Ken Okuno. This one is called Another Jesus. For the downtrodden who don't believe or the uplifted who won't bow, all the perfect and the weak ones who won't get on that train, please give us another Jesus. Are we not worthy as unwashed thieves, though we cannot bend our knees to pray? Another Jesus whose grace is not so clear-eyed, but whose mercy is beyond believing, whose heaven shows us just enough love, whose compassion beyond our imagining is tempered. A little is all we need, sweet Jesus, we are grateful. For the heaven that you made, though we know we cannot stay long, here comes the ripening by which we fall like a rain of hot fruit to midsummer. To another earth, another life, as we take our frail bodies for another chance, maybe do it right this time. 
Then the veil closes our eyes and we forget we are blessed as hummingbirds hungry for the nectar of our own hearts. Golden beings before the cladding of blood and bone, ego and cleverness, so we have forgotten. And if our stay on earth does not result in full salvation, are we not descended from the very emanation of compassion? Please, give us another Jesus, though we cannot bend our knees to pray, a Jesus of sufficient grace, a Jesus of greater mercy, a Jesus of tepid power, whose light shines just warm enough to raise us once again to the place we started, where at least our wounds, which we endure and bear with pride, our downfall can finally feel the truly light touch that will save us anyway. So, my notes here. I first met Connie Post at Poets for Trees. Yep. And that was with uh, Clara Sue and I, and that was at, at the McLaren uh, Park right. in the, um, the amphitheater. Jerry Garcia. Yeah. Jerry Garcia, Garcia yeah. amphitheater, yeah. yeah. And um, <coughs> I've heard her read several times over the years since, and um, she has a very fine and beautiful venue, Bologna Deli. Now, what city is that in again? I forgot. Yeah. Crockett, thank you. So if you have a chance, talk to her about it. It's a great place to read. Good food, great people, good crowd. It's like your, your magic there. Really, really good. The other thing is when I've heard her read, I, I feel you're always insightful. Even when you're talking about something ordinary, it sounds ordinary, like kitchen stuff or whatever it is, but there's insight in those things. And there's a kind of an intimacy in there where it's intimacy of, of spirit and mind, where you get inside my mind and the audience's mind, and you can see that they churn up, they take it in, and they, they're, they're thinking about it. And it, 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 it roils up there, and that's good. Soulful, that's another term. And uh, really well regarded. Pretty much everywhere I've seen you go, you, there's people you get like, oh yeah, come on! So, well regarded. She has a couple of books here which Dr. Salem, that's, she'll talk to you about that at the new course. And she asked me to mention this, which is very important. She has a new book, is Flood Water. Yeah. And uh, there's an organization called Lyre Bird, L Y R E. Is that a thing? It's, it's, yeah, it's an award. It's an award. And um, so her press, and it's, it's for best selling overall, overall book and best selling, right? That's the yeah. phrase. So okay. it's, a, it's, it's a well regarded book, it's something you can think about. and. Those are my notes. It's just really good to see you. I'm looking forward to this. I thought, oh boy, this is going to be a great evening. And I'm really pleased to present here to, to everyone. So give her a real nice warm round of applause. And she will just not the her real socks for a while. hard work that he does. Hosts carry secret sorrows. <laughs> it's, it's really a lot of work. And um, thank you for that gracious introduction. I would like to take you to the rest of my reading. I'm going to introduce you. <laughs> so um, I'm happy to be here. I was here a couple of years ago with my book about my son, my adult son who's 28, has severe autism when that book came out. That's what I was trying to remember. Yeah. Okay. And that, that book's here. And um, and I really love being here. I, it's a very welcoming audience. And I'm really excited about Flood Water because it's my first full-length book, and Black Flyer Press has been a wonderful press to work with. And so um, I, it came out in January, but still sometimes, you know, you go into the hallway, it's like you're holding like a small child. So um, when Richard Silver introduced me at my kickoff, he said a lot of the poems in this book are about loss. And when I was writing them, when I was putting them together, I didn't really realize that was true, but I guess in retrospect it is. But Flood Water, as the title indicates, is really a lot about immersion into ourselves, into our spiritual world, 
into certain kinds of loss. So I just got to set the stage by reading the title poem. Flood water. Flood water. All the rooms in the house are flooding, but there is no water. All of the people are drowning, but the lifeguard is in an irreversible coma. We walk around as if floating matters, as if there is a surface to find. We look for a syringe of air, a breathing tube of decency, but there are barely audible gasps that pretend to be language. There are lost fish swimming at our feet. It's as if only the walls understand why we get the bends every morning when we ride too fast. It's as if the last boat has pulled up its anchor. We sink to the bottom, grow gills, and swim past the lifeguard who has forgotten how to survive in a room with no air. Thank you very much. I always like to do at least one. Kevin and I have two dogs that are like our fur children, and we're kind of like having these abnormal attachments to the dogs. But we love them, and my first dog that was a rescue was Hanky, the golden retriever. And I wrote this shortly after we had adopted him, but he got, he broke through the fence, and he was like a little Houdini, so we called him Shawshank Hank, Break the Bank Hank, so he has all these nicknames. <laughs> He's being babies that time. After dinner, on the back porch with the dog breathing steadily next to me, I listen for the sounds in the night only he can hear. The crows have come back again, and his ears move like a symphony as the blackest of birds fly over us. I remember that only 14 days ago I had no dog, no other way of knowing how to breathe. But he wandered onto a wide street, then into my backyard, then into the back rooms of my psyche. Now on summer evening walks, he synchronizes his steps with mine, makes a telepathy of known pathways as if he understands how the stern, dark asphalt can be, as if he knows why I often stumble on the driveway. And when he looks at me before I remove his leash, I wonder how he has so easily found his way beneath the fences, the gates I thought I had closed, how forgiveness finds a small edge, a thin flat to glide through. Thank you. Um, I'm going to read for my husband parts of it. He's reading next, and it's challenging to be married to me. He has post-traumatic stress. <laughs> it's just very challenging for him. And, and so um, and I'm sure he'll read a few about me, which he'll probably get a chuckle over. And we're both poet laureate. Poets, I'm a former poet laureate of Livermore, and he's the current, so it's an interesting two poet laureate household. Just after seven, I step into our room to grab a sweater. The light is already fading, you have pulled the blind. I pause and notice the fiber of dark, how it remembers all the hours we've spent here in half-curled positions. It holds the filaments of whisper, absorbs the way you tell me, remember, I'm here, right before you drift off. We both know you can't enter the dreams of my own dying or feel the way night wraps itself in tight bands around the tourniquet of dawn. But the blackness knows, stares at me, tells me all I have is your steady breath. It is enough when I am certain every lamp on earth is broken. It is enough until I find warmer night, feel the fabric atone for this crumbling citadel of bleeding light. And then, in kind of contrast to that, this poem I wrote called Fire Escape, and it's really dedicated, not dedicated, but it made me think a lot about escaping bad relationships. Fire Escape. I think I could find this door if flames were everywhere. I think I could find the small exit sign if Orin held the scorching words crackling out of a mouth. Your mouth, to be exact. I swear my elbows could carry me across this flat room, even if I had to hold my breath. But no one told me I would need a crowbar for the door. 
I keep reminding myself I left you in my 20s, but find myself sitting sometimes in the same armchair, armchair, looking out a half-open window, screaming fire when no one else is in the room. I'm going to read one I don't really read that often, but I, I like this poem because I, I miss phone booths. And I miss that they're disappearing and that they are they basically have all disappeared. So loose chain. All of the telephone booths are disappearing. The sidewalks have forgotten how to speak. There will be no businessman finding shelter during the rain, calling wives, girlfriends, kids they have forgotten. People will pass and never notice him crying into the receiver, saying he never meant for it to turn out this way. There will be no mothers making sure their daughters have dimes, quarters, and pockets with no holes. The hinges have rusted like years we cannot close. The curves are growing and there is no place for old women to put on their coats after dusk. There is nowhere to go when you need one person to hand you a slim coin and silently understand, watch you close the thin doors around you. Thank you. This one um, is called Extremities. I think I wrote it when we were in the city. I like to people watch. And so I'll just not over intro it. Extremities. You can lose body parts crossing the street. You can lose your hands inside the outstretched arms of a woman's cardboard sign, disappear inside another country. You can lose your feet inside the tap dancer's shoes, the click, click, click on the pavement, a way to measure the world as it falls away in incremental eight counts. You can lose your skin to the wind. It finds the exact place where your pores are most open. You can lose your organs as they carefully fall outside of you while you step into a crosswalk. You can lose your brain as the pigeons fly over you, as the taxi cab runs too close to the curb and never understand why you were built like this, barely sustainable, commanded to stay whole while stepping over your swollen self, as if all those people you picked up along the way were never you. <laughs> I'm going to read um, a war poem. Unfortunately, I still keep thinking, wow, I wish we didn't have to keep knowing we're in war all the time. So I wrote this poem many years ago when uh, Professor was doing a project and he said, please write a poem to Iraq shortly after we invaded. And now I feel like it really applies to what we're doing again, continuing to invade these countries with innocent people. To Iraq, the epigraph is Kyrie eleison, Greek for Lord have mercy. To Iraq. I think of you most often at night when the ground is silent. I think of you when darkness invades when I can't roll over without waking my own subconscious. There is an empty vase on the dresser that makes a strange reflection in the dark. I wonder if it is Baghdad telling me it is trying to live. I wonder if it is another ending I cannot see. I feel your wounds open up <coughs> on my skin and press to close them, but the gauze folds away like peace. There is a small light across the street that calls to me, begging to know why I can fall asleep but you cannot, why the ceilings of a mosque have crumbled again. It is 11 p.m. and all I see in the dark is the hand of a small boy reaching, reaching out, pulling himself from the rubble but I cannot grab the hand, for it is the shape of a country and every finger is broken. I find that small sticks frantically glue them together, but as told in ancient languages, there is no splint for remorse. I cannot find a way to mend the quilts of each torn twilight. I keep going back each night, waking in the rubble of crushed stone. I want to say I'm sorry, 
but your sons and daughters are gone, and even the mosque has not stopped weeping. As the night coagulates, I keep remembering a prayer I was taught in Sunday school. I keep saying it to myself, even though I know the sky cannot hear it. Kyrie eleison, Lord have mercy on us. Kyrie eleison, when I butter my toast in the morning. Kyrie eleison, when I see the same boy's hand who cannot find bread or atonement. Kyrie eleison, for the sun who will someday swallow this earth and the ground who will no longer be silent. All right, so, um, Kevin Gunn is coming up next. He's the second half of this duo feature. So give him a nice round of applause, please. And we give Dan a nice round of applause for all the hard work he does. Here. poem's about her, by the way. It's called Speedway. She is the Danica Patrick of the spoken word. She can circumnavigate a conversation like a race car driver, steering between the syllables that drive the dialogue. She speeds through segues, fails to slow down and cross off the comprehension. She accelerates into every twist and turn, consideration and concern, clocking speeds of 200 words per minute. She maximizes mileage between breaths, Oral octane powers her high-velocity vernacular. As she downshifts her discourse, spins donuts around my attention span, and loses me at the corner of, who is Marilyn, and what in the hell are you talking about? You mentioned our dog. He's next to our dog, uh, our dog Hank, the golden retriever. This one's called the Promised Land. Sniff, circle, pirouette, lift. Sniff, circle, pirouette, lift. <laughs> this canine catechism is a sacrament practiced on bushes, hybrids, trees, and fence posts. There is something religious about this ceremonial circling, its rhythm and cadence, the reverence a dog gives to each potential target. Every smell and nuance of leaf, bark, trunk, and root is carefully measured. I wonder how they choose which are worthy. Do they pee in protest, a sort of condemnation urination, expressing disapproval? Or do they pee in praise, a hallelujah chorus sprinkled in bow wow baptism for their appreciation? It is too much ritual to render it random. Sniff, circle, pirouette, lift. If only somehow my dog could speak, I'd learn the Zen of taking the leap. <laughs> Another poem about my dog Hank. Uh, it's called The Nose Knows. I jiggle the leash, the jumping begins. His tail wags at warp speed. It's time for my walk with Hank. Our official route is the bike path, but the journey is never the same. Hank's nose runs the show. This two-nostril GPS system tracks every scent within range. It is a highly sensitive instrument. It considers everything and incessantly asks the proverbial question, to pee or not to pee? <laughs> I try to keep up, maintain some level of control, but to Hank, longitude and latitude are nothing more than attitude. Take a sudden left, prepare to stop, veer right, watch out for the tree, circle around, don't hit the fence post, and back up twist the leaves to get her hand. The longer we walk, I wax philosophic. An unsniffed world is an unexamined world. Sniff and ye shall find. <laughs> One good sniff deserves another. And, Descartes be damned, I sniff 
therefore I am. <laughs> I had some blood sugar issues this last summer, and uh, kind of ate out. Of, he was getting out of control, and uh, so I, I uh, had to go in and, and work on some dieting. And I was uh, wrote a poem this summer about that. Uh, that I spent a lot of time in the backyard. It's called "The Diary of a Diabetic Hummingbird." It's another diabetic day, and I've got a craving for something sweet, but it's becoming harder to find the right stuff to eat. Sugar-free stamens are in short supply and nuka-sweet nectar is difficult to come by. <laughs> and apparently it's not easy to grow flowers that bloom with sweetening low. <laughs> I can hover here and there. In fact, I could hang out most anywhere till I find the cupboard there. I guess I need to change, modify my agenda. There just aren't that many snapdragons with Splenda. <laughs> <laughs> my bill is not designed for eating meat and nuts and bugs are hardly a treat. Fruit may be healthy, but I can't chew it. I'd need some incisors to carve my way through it. My fast food feeders hang me out to dry. The liquid is tempting, but too sweet to try. I wish I understood how my body hums and just why I'm counting carbs in chrysanthemum. <laughs> so I have some issues with, the, with junk food, eating the wrong kind of food, and uh, this poem is called Dating. I broke up with burritos, took a salad to the dance. I'm trying to kindle a steady romaine romance. <laughs> I party with Pop-Tarts, slept around with s'mores, given hickeys to ho-hos, and a host of high-calorie whores. <laughs> Self-destructive dating has latched onto my hips, every cookie and cupcake that French kiss my lips. A long-term relationship with potato chips and fries has put its cholesterol clutches on my butt cheeks and thighs. <laughs> Cakey dishes seduce me, the face turn my head. If dessert bars wore short skirts, I'd take them to bed. <laughs> Fast food and slow food is committed like glue. The fifth course is intercourse. Is it good for you? <laughs> uh, changing tempos, uh, this poem is called The Hourglass. Cerebral sands trickle down, buried memory at the bottom of the hourglass. Lucidity leaks, spills on the floor, kills comprehension, not to mention leaving recognition at the door. Incremental insanity, sinister synapses hijack humanity. Demon dementia taunts, teases, and haunts. A sense of urgency steps forward. Closure is coveted while family memories become endangered species. I had to put my mom in Alzheimer's care home this summer, and uh, so we're dealing with that right now. This poem's called Off the Hook. Hangers went to bed like shards of slumber and interrupted sleep. To her, the closet is a haunted house. On top, multicolored mood swings wait to be outfitted on silhouettes of circumstance. Sarcasm splits off broken clip. Doubt dips to lower rack. Merges with phobias. A phalanx of fears dressed in dark colors. Subconscious scenarios scuff the floor. Hangers never go back the same way she took them out. Thank you. Uh, yeah, perfect. This one's called The Caterpillar. She millimeters her way along the sidewalk, measures her minuscule steps, tries not to slip. Maximum effort required, ground slightly gained, nerves greatly strained. So far to go, a journey lengthened by limitations. Progress a matter of perspective, five days clean and sober. My sister's been clean and sober for about 30 days right now, and that's huge for her. Good. So I'm praying she'll keep it up. Good luck. Thank you. Diner. Hungry parishioners dine in the pews. Catholic cuisine garnished with guilt. A sanctimonious smor smorgasbord served up on sacraments, dry doctrines, difficult to swallow. Crusty catechisms are stuck in the throat. Hollow Hail Marys relief with the most. Past the pesto, 
Taylor, if you please. I suffer from spiritual reflux disease. <laughs> <laughs> I retired from teaching high school uh, after 39 years last June, and I've been collecting poems about, about teaching that I hope someday get published. This one's called Anybody? I ask the class a question, wait for a response. The seconds calendar over me like the month of January. Nothing. Not one student has anything to say. I rephrase, thinking they don't understand. Still not a stir. I attempt to stimulate a discussion, clarify what I mean, offer an illustration. The lesson glaciers along. I look at the clock, pray for a thaw. Only five minutes have passed. Feels like an eternity to a teacher on ice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Huh? Oh, yeah, do, yeah, oh, do a special request. Do which one? Okay. This one's really short. Peanut butter. Some students stick the roof of my mouth by peanut butter. Their unpalatable presence spreads over the classroom with thick remarks I find difficult to swallow. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. You guys have been a great audience. I appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, my God. As a fellow teacher, a teacher I appreciate the people. <laughs> and I, I seem to be soon to be retired myself. That's, that's what I'm working on because of Yay! Thank you so much. We're gonna take we're gonna take a short break here. We'll be right back. Stop that thing right now. And um, there's books for sale. Talk to her, we'll talk to her, you talk to me, I'll talk to you, and we'll talk to each other in a world of talking. So seven, eight minutes, and we'll be back. We have several poets coming up. Uh, Marco Harbs, Ed Mike Hugh, and David Erdreich, who's the mini teacher, also the closer tonight. Enjoy your talks. Thank you so much. We'll be back in due course. So oh, yeah, yeah. I like that too. Yeah. I hope you're. Uh, well, you must be enjoying it by now. Yeah. The year, right? Yeah. Oh, Lori. No, no, no. The, the, the retirement. Oh yeah. So it's right. kind of like a year. It's like yeah. I know what life is like. Again. It's only just June, so as much as I enjoy yeah. teaching, I don't so much right now. I, I, I like interacting with kids and, and the, the, the classroom experience when it's good. It's, there's nothing like that. I, I, I love it. Right. Or this year, the chaos. So anyhow, it's almost lost. Yeah. Just like yeah. 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 The cell phone's been paying the last few years. Yeah, we, we're, we're having a, the vice principal of high school report. She, she joined her cell phone now. And I go, good luck. Because I tell this one particular couple of people who need to move and know that you know, they're late. Right? Turn the way and put it down the back and it goes about that. I'm actually supposed to take them away. We did that for a while, and we put an envelope in it, instead of the office. Yeah. But then the secretary lost a bunch of kids, so she can't do that. Well, the issue with me is actually the need to move it of the child's feet. That's because, because you have to actually sometimes touch the hand of the child or something, and that's because, so I don't do it, I just tell them right away. Yeah, but we, we had a parent call one time, interrupt his class, give me the phone. So so that that I've done that. Okay, that's what I I've done that. 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 Uh, one child had a water bottle. So we talked about not having a water bottle because it's spilled. So what happened is someone took a water bottle, dropped in a piece of plastic something or 
brother. That's so the point. She was dead serious about who she thought had done this. So she was talking to someone about this person who had done this. Someone overheard her and got upset at her because she believed it wasn't that person. Then someone else said that this other kid had told this other kid that this kid had done something and was calling the first kid names. Two others had something going on, either to do with that first incident or the second. But I didn't get that far in terms of who had said what about who, who had done what and when. Because it all came to fruition in a short, like, five or six minute period. I didn't know the math was. Right and the best I could do was put out the fire and have one kid cool off. Well, she decided to cool off by throwing your desk around. Oh, no, no, not near anybody. And in such a controlled way that no one was going to get her. She was, or whatever, she wanted to demonstrate. Yeah. So, like, that was the first desk I had to I had a water bottle at that too. I'm watching these kids take a water bottle and then the kid goes on top of the head. And so I write out the, the referral to the vice principal and send them over. Yeah. Well, the, the mom calls the principal and, and, and she says to me, because her son apparently has a diabetic and needs to have water. So they gave him a throw it at somebody's head? Yeah. So I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. So I, all he had done was tell me he was diabetic and I, I would give him, what about I, the I, I, on the head I would have given him some water. I would have poured some water out of my water bottle to drink during class. Yeah, what about no. the hitting on the head part? Well, yeah, the, the VP was great. She said, look, he does this huge behavior, he can't hit somebody with a water bottle. Yeah. She told the mom off and said, he's gotta have to apologize to Mr. Blah, blah, blah. So she handled it well. Yeah. But, yeah. The but the thing is like, you know, it's like, you're trying to teach a lesson. Yeah. 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 Can, can, can Evan take a picture of all three of us? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, so we only have an offerable. 
We'll be back in just one minute if you kindly get ready for our return to the open mic. We have uh, Marco Hartz. Looks like Christian. Christian, is that your name? Christian? Christian, Ed Mike Hugh, and then Dan, David Erdreich, our mini and the closer. So we're going to come back in just about a minute. Please get yourselves ready for that. It's going to be good. As good as you can imagine. And then some. Just to let you know that uh, when you do the keynote, you're still eligible for the open mic. And Mark, you're bringing us back up after the open. Then we have uh, Christian, Ed, and then David out of the mic. Are you ready, Mark? Yeah. Okay, he's coming up there, so we'll give him a round of applause on his big. Good. Did he say I'm going back up? After the open, I, I don't know. You get. Uh, I think I am. Keynote still participated in the open. The keynote is. The note 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 is. Hey, you got any more people? Thank you. Any kind of rain would be lovely at this point. Oh, what, what is that? Start it up, Mark. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
right, thank you. What, that brings us now to Christian, then Ed, then David. They're the right our mini clubs or so. Christian, come on up and give him a nice round. He hasn't been here in a while, so. We'll warm it up and we'll be there before you can say, go get me. Well, one of the uh, former uh, hosts here, whose name was Johanna Wedgwood, yeah. and I used to read down the street at the Blue Unicorn in the 60s. It's uh, now a laundromat, but it was a coffee house that had weekly poetry reading. Oh, I remember that. I want to make that announcement. Do you have to What do you do? I love laundry mats. My dad hates Junkies scat and winos hit up burned out tourists. Street cops zoom down telegraph hill on skateboard. Stock jazz ballads oozle from old cornets on busy corners. Teenagers interlaced in strip show booths in front of metal window shades that never rise. Cooks on break between the fiction stacks and magazine racks and city lights, bookstore, waiters turn over half-eaten entrees to two-legged cats haunting kitchen back doors in foggy back streets off Columbus and Broadway, waylaid refugee instigators from the Midwest flaunt wreath embossed nickels, baggies in the North Beach proving grounds, jiving heavy trays and bargos sanitized cafes and skunk haze enveloping the inlet between Spex and Tosca. And, uh, that was an old one and a couple of short new ones. From the wood that forged intimacy with Caliban's collateral innocence in the dimness led astray while Grendel's hunt on paths Hardly predestined, missteps and detours, blamed on an absent moon, journeys prolonged by the, the insomnias, latest thoughts blurred. Those scorn the ghosts of those who were making a living average of hours they'd slept could be relevant. Siestas as well. Pisti Sophia. The best lines of Sappho, Dante, Keats, and Basho, in spite of the Bhagavad Gita, Bible, Quran, Kabbalah, Kabbalah and especially the Maleus Maleficorum and the Flagellum Demonum the double espresso, the double cross. Oh. And uh, last of all, Oscar doing time, three quarters of a century on the planet, i.e. 75 years on Earth, or a male body in its seventh decade, therefore Wilde's portrait, when it no longer flatters, but begins to horrify hair graying and thinning, forehead furrowed, eyes bleary, cheeks caving in, wrinkles around lips, and what is not visible on canvas, time's victim notices, emergence of sagging breasts, arm and leg skin anything but taut, rump flattening, belly protruding. Might as well be the last chapter of a picture of Dorian Gray. Thank you, Christian. Good job. Welcome back to you. All right, Ed, Mike, you, then David, Aaron, the Reich, our media closer, who will take care of these wonderful prizes distributed, as I say, and designed with your mind. Nice round. Or a noble. 
Two poles on poles. Rumble, seek, pierce arrow. Lately, when I have dream, dreamed of home, what appears is that river bottom cabin where two men lived and took my brothers and me out in their fishing boat uh, and just seeing the shore light as my father Jack kicks back reclining on shore dreaming baseball. Back to that time of the pierced arrow with the rumble seat where we rode free to the sky, cars with dogs in them and with the rumble seat the mid 40s it was they were old even then and the guys back from World War II who had them and we loved them ducking down into the space inside when windy or cold or you were afraid or my dad and the other guys were a bit worried we bounced over potholes roots humps heading down to the river and their cabin some tribu tributary of our Niagara River I remember those two guys who lived down there after, back from the war, and the one who had a leg off, used to grab me and haul me up over the ditches and, and the tree roots, and he, this was the blonde hunk with the missing leg, but some replacement in his 20s, who my dad used to play baseball with. And the other guy my, was my dad's buddy from their Boy Scouts days or from the Tuscarora Reservation near Niagara. Lately, when I have dreamed, dreamed of home, what appears a home to me is that rumble scene. And this poem is called Home. Many of us could never go home, even when we had not left it. Home is a wind song in our hearts. These hearts have exploded, repositioned themselves, ending as much the men themselves as the remainder's hearts. This, then, is home. And I'll finish with a poem called A Condition. Or condition. You don't need contrition for a condition. Maybe an explanation will do. Maybe it's an act, not a crime. You don't need permission to see the blind. It's a condition. Don't ask vindication. Frighten the dark. No negatives first. Follow your thirst. Trust intuition. It's the condition. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You. And now David has the relations coming up here. Give him a round of applause for me.
We will bring everything that we sing, Ritmo Cubano so sweet. We will start with the beat in your heart, seat of the beat that repeats, making our choices, blending the voices, playing forever. That's our endeavor. There's a spawn, there's a pulse, there's a shout. Chano and Izzy, no doubt. And continue the beat in our hearts. Seat of the beat that repeats. Dancing and swaying. Fragrance conveying. Beat dancing rhythm. Soul searching with them. The melody, a little bit of bump, makes me burn in my body. I learn that harmony is hidden in a chord where my faith in all men is restored. Oh, tin tin day oh. 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 Jazz pants, like a breeze in the trees, Caribbean jazz vance. Ooh, loving each minute out here in the woods. Good, good enough to be sharing the music with you. Since I can, I will share all the music with you. Good enough to be sharing the jazz pants, like a breeze in the trees, Caribbean jazz vance. Ooh, loving each minute out here in the woods. Good. Good enough to be sharing the music with you. Since I can, I will share all the music with you. Good enough to be sharing the music. Yeah, oh, 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 day. Here's what I wrote today. Hit the road again into the wilderness. Go west, young man. Steal as much as you can from earlier cultures. Listen only to the brass hats whose legal rigmarole classifies innocent humans as collateral damage. Droning on until wings fall off in death. Murder by proxy, by lottery. Killing mothers and children by accident. Justice is not only blind, she drops her scales. There's no distinction between domestic and foreign policy. A right to trial by a jury of your peers? Out the window. Give tanks and drones to the local police forces or sell these to them if they're stupid enough to buy them. Step right up. We're next. Cheaper than housing felons? Ah, yes, the final solution. All this from a president linked to Martin Luther King. Please. Make the distinction. A little add and a little photo. At least they're not killing white people yet. However, if you look closely, <laughs> we're all people of color. Yeah, if you look closely, this is yesterday, shimmer, or two days ago. Can you step inside the painting? As the figures start to move, carriage rolling, horses neighing, traveling beyond the groove. Like a snapshot held in stasis. You remember deja vu, for you saw it in a dream that would not that you'd not yet happened to. When the future is the present, given as a gift of sight, just a particle that's waving like a day that's left the light, perhaps you've caught the world on edge. Mirror ripples pass you through, like a cactus in the desert, poking spine or tasting stew. The tip, the point, the dot, are gone. You've disappeared from view. Trace or outline, fading aura, transformation, old as new. Mark the passage, drop the breadcrumbs, seek the path, or stay in the groove. Find the way, set the signpost. 
for the progeny behind you. Yeah, there's one more. Monday on a Friday. Mundane morning, plain and boring, cubicle blues, zeros and twos, binary pairing, right or wrong, just two choices, neither one a song, corporate body stringing along, CIA, mafia, ISIS, Tong, bland, inadequate, impotent nerd, sheep, invisible, one of the herd, doesn't stand out, doesn't fit in, muddle in the middle, where to begin, anger, impatient, brittle, seethe, part of the problem, you forgot to breathe, just lost in the porn of your imagination, no conception of your own gestation, mirror reflection, speck of dust. Is it really God you trust? Can it be luck? Might it be fate? You're not on time if you're early or late. Hurry, scurry down the wainscot hole. Always do just what you're told. Cipher nothing, zero, Z. Even when your eyes are open, some assume you're dead. Cul-de-sac, dead end, end of the road, world on your shoulders, such a heavy load, under a cloud, straw that broke the camel's back, can't get away from that parallel track, trying to switch gears, in your manual transmission, you're not a machine, you're a man. Now listen!
finger to braid an intimate seal for what seems like the longest seconds ever made. The deeper you squeeze, the weaker my knees, the quicker I need to break away, lest anyone guess my motives or question my masculine ways. Your mono, wide, lined, and comfortably rough, fits mine like a broken in mitt or favorite leather glove. As we greet for our game of catch, with our pair of hands mutually clenched and clasped in mutual love. <laughs> Semester before last, I think I read this before too. They met semester before last in September, around 7.30 early, student lounge, study couch, straight A average contenders, straight as an arrow pretenders. They reconnected one day late on their way to class, rushing past each other, opposite sides of campus. Then, by happenstance, one fast night they crisscrossed paths in mid-November, a moment stolen after the coffee shop closed when the moon rose so seductively behind thick bushes and trees, so discreetly as to leave no shadow and stir no breeze. In a December dorm, post-final exams, pre-Christmas week, they discovered burning love in the embers that remained when most classmates escaped back home for the holidays. Once winter break was over, the school year resumed with the next semester arriving too quickly, ending too soon. The time had come for one to leave while the other still had a year to complete. And though their love couldn't compete with the miles that would grow between their lives or the people they'd later meet, they always knew that if and when they saw each other again, they would finally remember their last semester together as college lovers and friends. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. And then we'll take care yeah. of these. So it's a quick announcement. Give her another round because Thank of that. Thank you. 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 This Sunday at 5 o'clock, there's going to be a really important benefit poetry reading in Berkeley at the Berkeley Art House. I'm going to be reading with Al Young, who many of you may know as the poet laureate of the yeah. former poet laureate of the state of California, and a, another poet named Kelly Crespio Muller. So Harold Adler founded the Art House Gallery. We need to support the arts. So if you're in Berkeley, us three will be reading. It's a $10 donation, but I really think it's important to keep art and studios such as his open. So if you're around, uh, please join us. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to Dan. Thank you so much. All right, so um, where'd those things go? I just have here, they're gonna go. That's the paper writing, right? Oh no. So if you've signed in, you notice that you signed in next to a number, and uh, since your name has a number next to it, I have these cards with numbers. To make a long story Who's short, shuffle I shuffle the, the cards. She will shuffle the oh, cards. Shuffle them. Oh, shuffle them. I shuffle them, cut them like that. Okay. And while she's doing that, Rosencrantz and Gildersperm. The Palladinsio, the Palladinsio, the keynote, the mini feature, and another uh, donation by Stephanie Manning, Wilfred Owens' war poem, so she read from that tonight. Uh, yoga Sutras of Fidel Castro, I know nothing about this one, it's not my responsibility. Jack Gershman says it's one of the all-time greatest. Jack Gershman says it's one of the best things. I really Dylan on it. the durable, Dylan on uh, the uh, <laughs> Dylan the durable on Dylan Thomas, Seamus Haney. This is good, and then Dizzy Ba, a really nice magazine that's been around for a long time. And then all that is an assortment of magazines. So she has shuffled them. A drum roll, please, if you don't mind. Thank you so much. We begin. Let me get my glasses on here so I can read my own handwriting. Karen Huff, did she, she, I think she went already, yes? She huffed it. She went out in the house. She went out in the house. 
Does anybody want I never say this that classic in National Geographic? <laughs> Just checking. Yeah. I do. There you go. Uh, all right. So I want to thank you for coming this evening. Uh, it's been a long and running open mic for that I know of in the universe and known universe. Good night, Mr. Calabash, wherever you are. And give yourself a round of applause That's for enjoying right. yourselves oh, and enjoying right. this. Come back next week to Bat Time, saying Bat Station, where we will inveigle you with things that will amaze your own mind. Thank you so much, ladies you and gentlemen. Yeah, one of these. Dante! Yeah, you don't dance.
born in Buffalo. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, I want you know, I was born in Niagara Falls with my brothers and sisters. And yeah, me and Paul were born there too. I had one friend who I knew you know, I was That name, I moved away when I was 11, but so I didn't know it. I was born in a 37 session before. I had a brother who was born in 35, and then I had another brother at 39, and then I had four